Imagine you receive a text message containing an audio file or a video file from an unknown number and you click on it to play the media. Imagine that the action of you simply playing that media on your iPhone has now given a remote attacker full control over your device and they are now observing everything you do from that point on. How would this actually work in practice? Today we're going to dive into the world of media passing vulnerabilities on iOS and investigate a real world example from very recent times. For iOS or any other OS to be able to play media files, it needs to be able to handle many popular codecs used to encode said media. There are countless different codecs used to encode audio, video, and images, and the system needs to implement logic for each of these so that it's able to decode them when it needs to. Consider video files, for example. You'll probably be familiar with container formats such as .mp4 or .mov. However, within these containers lies the actual video stream data which will be compressed according to the spec of a given video codec. On iOS, Apple implements most of their decoding logic in their shared libraries that any process can call into. These code bases are naturally a hot zone for bugs. They deal with enormous input structures coming from fully user-controlled media files. The parsing logic is deep and often very complex, so it would be silly to think that there wouldn't be cases where the incoming data isn't handled correctly leading to vulnerabilities. And as an attacker, being able to reach this much complex code through the sending of a simple media file makes these parsing bugs a perfect candidate for the entry point in an exploit chain. Apple is continuously pushing updates to iOS, many of which include security fixes. While most of these fixes are reported to Apple by independent security researchers, very occasionally we'll actually see a bug that was found to be exploited in the wild against real iPhone users. And that's what we saw just last month when Apple released iOS 18.4.1, a minor software update, but one that patched a very interesting vulnerability. Viewing the security notes page, we can see that a bug was patched in the core audio framework and was assigned CVE 2025-31200. The brief description tells us that processing an audio stream in a maliciously crafted media file may result in code execution. And not only that, Apple then notes that they are aware of a report that this issue may have been exploited in an extremely sophisticated attack against specific targeted individuals on iOS. So this obviously sounds really bad. Simply playing a media file containing the malicious audio stream can be enough to compromise your whole phone. But again, how can this actually work? As of the time of recording this video, there's been no real public analysis done on the specific bug. No exploit sample was provided by Apple. And so the only information that we have to work with is the minimal description on Apple's security notes website. So today in this video, not only do I want to discuss the technical details of this particular bug, but I also actually want to walk through the process and methodology used to research a bug like this, given the limited information online. So where do we even start with this? We don't know any specifics of the bug, but all we know is that it lies within the core audio framework on iOS. To actually locate the point in code where the bug was patched, we're going to make use of a very popular technique known as binary patch diffing. Patch diffing is the process of comparing or diffing two versions of the same software to identify a patch. So in our case, using the CVE description as guidance and our understanding of common vulnerability types, we should be able to investigate further into the cause of a bug by comparing the unpatched and the patched version. For example, imagine you were presented some code and told that there is a bug. Without performing some analysis of your own, the bug might not be immediately visible to you. However, if you're then presented a second piece of code and told that this is the same code as the previous version, but a bug has been patched, you'll have a much easier time. You simply compare the two functions and suddenly the bug becomes very visible to you. You'll see that the simple new check that was added in the second piece of code highlights that there was a very obvious buffer overflow in the first. This is how patch diffing works. For our use case, we obviously don't have the source code at hand. All we have is the binary files that can be found within the iOS firmware update. So we'll need to use a decompiler to help us with actually doing the diffing. iOS firmware updates are packaged into IPSW files, which can be downloaded at any time from Apple's servers. Inside each IPSW archive, you'll find everything from the bootloaders, the kernel cache, coprocessor firmware, and the shared libraries. Since the CVE description tells us that the bug is within core audio, which is a user space framework on iOS, we know that we only need to focus on the shared libraries, which are held within the DYLD shared cache. We'll need a way to actually extract our chosen framework from the DYLD shared cache so that we can analyze it. 
The popular disassembler and decompiler IDA Pro by Hexrays is able to do this natively. Hexrays is also the sponsor of today's video, and I want to thank them for providing me an IDA Pro license to use in the creation of this video to demonstrate the patch diffin. If you're also a security researcher or reverse engineer, you can visit hexrays.com and use the discount code BILLY50 to get 50% off your next IDA Pro individual license purchase. Or you can use the same discount code to get 30% off of Hexrays' extensive set of trainings to advance your reverse engineering skills. More information can be found in the description below. If we download IPSW files for both iOS 18.4 and 18.4.1, the newly patched version, we can use a Diffin plugin along with IDA Pro to compare the two binaries. There are a few different Diffin plugins available online, and the one I'm going to be using today is Diaphora. Now here's where Apple throws a slight curveball. IDA Pro tells us that core audio is identical on both versions, meaning Apple did not change or patch the code in any way. So how could this be, given the fact that they tell us there is a patch in core audio? Well, it turns out that Apple is occasionally lazy in their notes on where a particular bug occurred. They'll often group a set of frameworks under a single umbrella term, such as core audio, even if the bug isn't actually in the core audio binary. So while core audio is listed on the security notes page, in reality, the bug is actually in a different binary file, part of the audio toolbox framework, another framework on iOS involved in the audio processing pipeline. So let's instead compare the audio codex binary file. This time we can see that IDA does indeed report differences between the two, which is what we wanted to see. The first function here has actually not changed at all other than memory addresses. So we can ignore this since this is just due to recompilation, which naturally causes some static addresses to change. The only other function that has changed is this one, APAC HOA codec config deserialize. And comparing the pseudocode for this function between the two versions confirms that there is in fact new logic that was added into the iOS 18.4.1 patch. So this must be the vulnerable function that we're looking for. So where is the bug exactly? You'll probably notice that this real life example is nowhere near as simplistic as the example mentioned earlier. This is of course to be expected, but by analyzing the two versions, we should still be able to understand what new checks were added and try to figure out what these checks were preventing on the previous version. Diaphora allows us to compare both at the assembly level and the decompiled pseudocode level. In this case, the pseudocode is gonna be much easier for us to follow to get a bigger picture view of what is going on. Before we look at the actual code itself, let's first look at the function name. APAC HOA codec config deserialize. So this is obviously responsible for deserializing some data format, which again is exactly the kind of function we'd expect to find these kind of media parsing bugs in. But what is APAC HOA? A quick Google search returns that HOA stands for high order ambisonics and APAC stands for Apple Positional Audio Codec. So this is some special format for 3D immersive audio. Before doing any static analysis, I wanted to see if I could actually reach the vulnerable function by supplying an audio file to the device that is in this specific format. A Google search for HOA sample files didn't really yield any results, and ChatGPT didn't know much about it either. Then I came across some information on Apple's own website where they actually discuss spatial audio and the iPhone 16. So as it turns out, the spatial audio format that we're looking at here is something that the iPhone 16 Pro is able to natively encode when recording videos in the camera app. I don't actually own an iPhone 16, so I just went to the Apple store, picked one up and recorded a two second video of nothing, making sure to enable spatial audio in the settings app. Then I just airdropped this video to my personal phone. With this sample video, I wanted to confirm that I could hit the vulnerable deserialize function. The function itself is within a shared library, so we actually need to find a good candidate process that makes use of the library. Media Playback D was the first one that came to mind since this is the main component on iOS that's involved in the media decoding pipeline. So I attach my debugger to media playback D and I set a breakpoint on the vulnerable function. I then simply try to play the spatial video on my research device. And just as I'd hoped, LODB suspended the process right at the breakpoint, confirming that we're hitting the vulnerable deserializer. Cool, so now we know we have a way to reach the vulnerable code. Let's look closer at the patch itself. From briefly scanning the pseudocode diff, we can see that there's been some block reordering and that there's a new function call to bitstream reader skip bits, which wasn't there in the previous version. The rest of the code isn't super easy to follow. We have a lot of accesses to addresses being made relative to the first argument, and we see lots of checks on these values. We see loops and we see memory writes. The function is clearly quite complex, so it'll be easier for us if we actually spend a minute reversing it a bit deeper to assign some meaning to all of these address accesses. First, we know that this is obviously a C++ method just by looking at the way it's named. 
C++ methods always have a hidden first argument, which is the this value, which is a pointer to the object on which we're invoking the method. So we can just rename A1 to this. And we know that this object type is codec config. Many of the addresses accessed are relative to the this variable. So using the debug strings as guidance, we can build up a bit of a picture for what the structure of the codec config object is supposed to look like. Then we can use IDA Pro to define a structure based on our understanding of this. Now that we've done that, you can see that we're seeing named property accesses rather than just meaningless offsets. We can apply this reverse into both of the versions and redo the diff. Now things look a bit clearer. We can see that some parsing is done on the M remapping array vector, and this parsing happens in a loop. On each iteration, we assign a value to a given index in this remapping array. At the end of each iteration, we also check if this element that we added is greater than a value derived from an audio channel layer object, and error out if so. On the patched version, Apple has actually changed it such that the value we're checking at the end of each iteration is instead derived from another field, which I've labeled as total components. And this field is assigned a value calculated by the number of ambient components plus the number of HOA coefficients earlier in the function. So what does this suggest? Well, it must mean that on the unpatched version, it's possible that the value being used as the loop check could be out of sync with the actual size of the array that we're operating on. And then this could obviously lead to all kinds of issues. The new version, presumably, we are now checking against the correct value for this loop. And this check must prevent the future memory corruption or otherwise buggy state. So based on this, initially I thought this was going to be a very nice out of bounds write primitive on the assignment made to the M remapping array. I assumed that on the vulnerable version, it would be trivial to have a malicious audio channel layout that allows you to declare too many remapping entries, for example, and that would allow us to cause the remapping loop to run past the end of the array and start writing values out of bounds into adjacent memory. The new check seems to prevent this obviously by limiting the loop to the total number of components, which is calculated dynamically based on the actual argument data. However, I did some further digging and even though the loop maximum is now being checked against a new value, there still didn't seem to be a very clear way in which I could achieve out of bounds write because the M remapping array is still seemingly properly sized based on the loop counter, even on the vulnerable version. So at this point in my research, I was kind of disappointed to not have a nice simple memory corruption primitive to work with, but I did want to do a little bit more analysis on the other changes to rule out any other possibilities. On the vulnerable version, when the loop counter reaches the incorrect maximum channels value, the function returns, not just from the loop, but it fully returns. On the new version, however, there's a little bit more logic at play. When the loop counter reaches the maximum channel value, which itself is obviously the new variable that we discussed, code actually flows back to a section before the loop started. This section then reassigns some values based on the audio channel layer object, and then calls a new function, bitstream reader skip bits, which presumably forwards the logical cursor in the bitstream object, and then it returns. Since this new call to skip bits is actually happening immediately before this function returns, we can infer that maybe the actual memory corruption is happening somewhere outside of this function in one of its callers, and that this call was added to skip some redundant bits in the stream that could lead to undefined behavior, and in some way link to the issue with the memory mapping array. I spoke with another researcher, Noah, who was also looking at this bug, and he had had a similar theory that the memory corruption actually occurred at a later point when something else in the code tried to make reference to the remapping array in some way. However, neither of us were able to actually get anything working in practice. That was until, however, I began editing this video and Noah actually contacted me again with a new discovery. Using some scripts published by another researcher, Zhou Wei, he was able to craft an audio file that contained a specific tweaking of values in the audio channel layout object such that when it was played on macOS, it actually did lead directly to a crash. The function that actually led to the crash was APAC HOA decoder decode APAC frame, a function in a different part of the code base used to actually decode an audio frame. And this of course proved the earlier theory correct, that the actual memory corruption happened later on and was actually a side effect of the incorrect preparation involving the M remapping array. I've not done any further digging or root cause analysis into the actual memory corruption trigger, so this is as much as we'll cover in this video today. In terms of actually exploiting this bug, we are completely left in the dark. No exploit sample has been published online, so we really don't have anything to work with regarding an exploit strategy. 
However, based on iOS bugs of a similar category, such as the BlastPass WebP vulnerability and the forced entry GIF passing bug, we can assume that due to the memory corruption, some level of code execution is then achieved within a critical system process on iOS that was making use of the vulnerable HOA decoder. It's also worth noting that in the iOS 18.4.1 security notes, a pack bypass that was fixed in this same version is also mentioned here. So the attackers were likely able to achieve native code execution in user space by using the HOA bug and the pack bypass together. So in conclusion, and based on the minimal analysis discussed in this video, we can assume that an attacker with a maliciously crafted video file containing a malicious spatial audio stream could be sent to a victim's device. The victim's device will try to pass the HOA stream, but be manipulated in such a way that it causes some kind of memory corruption within the target process. And from here, the attacker can likely achieve native code execution within that system process by leveraging the pack bypass. Beyond this point, they would of course be free to execute any code they want, including a second stage exploit, targeting the kernel and thus compromising the entire system. Further analysis onto the actual memory corruption or even the exploitation of this bug would be a potentially interesting future research project. If you'd be interested in a second part to this video, then let me know in the comments below. That is it for today's video. All relevant links will be in the description below. Also, thanks again to Hexrays for sponsoring today's video. And be sure to use the discount code BILLY50 to get the 50% off. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I will see you in the next one.